All right, team, welcome back to the podcast. We're doing a, uh, a deep dive, a shoot the shit episode with, uh, with my good friend, Paulie. Paulie, how are you, sir? I'm very, very well, my man. Uh, how is life with you, Tommy? Life is very good. And I think today's uh, podcast is very pertinent um, to, to where, where the curriculum of my life is, is guiding me at the moment. I think um, as someone who's always kind of struggled to, to um, find peace um, without distraction, you know, our angle of the podcast today being finding that, um, that, that productivity, that awareness, that acceptance of boredom um, mm. as a teacher and what can what it can teach you is, is is something that's really coming up a lot with me at the moment. I think, you know, I reckon it was maybe six or seven shows ago I was talking about how despite the fact that I love meditation, I don't necessarily have a, a stringent practice or a daily routine mm. with it, but it's become very important for me um, within the past week just to right. settle into my mind, you know, and, um, and it just given the, the abundance of distraction and stimuli out there in this day and age, coming back to who I am, what I believe in, what I thought about certain pieces of content that sprung forth upon the phone, um, you know, the types of conversations I had, it's becoming much more of a necessity for me to find my center point again. So I'm really looking forward to discussing this with you today, mate. Yeah, it's going to be cool. So like we were talking about this uh, just earlier before we press record and, and and the sense is like, you know, what is boredom and is that like kind of a lost art mm. in today's day and age? I know for me, I get caught into this cycle and this trap of, constantly needing to tap into the stimulus, this smorgasbord of stimulus that we have available to us in the modern world that we live in. Mm. Podcasts, music, Spotify is like this, like just this plug-in matrix that we can just constantly have um, into our brains and not have to have like an independent thought mm. without it. And it comes under the guise of education or entertainment, uh, but there's something about, stillness and silence that activates the uh, centers in your brain that you may feel is boredom at very first but really once you start delving into it and as you mentioned you know like delving into the space between the notes it, that, that you can really really um start to it starts to nourish you that stillness so yeah whilst whilst initially that is boredom what does boredom kind of turn into Exactly. And, and that's a really great um, point to make, I think, because a lot of people will hear boredom and not necessarily with the words, but they will, um, it will bring them to this sense of, you know, how can I describe boredom? It, it's kind of like this, this, this abundance of time in a moment um, with, with many things that one could do without necessarily being able to see um, which is better than the other, you know? Mm. So you can't make a value judgment about 10 different things that you could do right now. So therefore mm. you find yourself in this state of deciding, you're just constantly deciding, but you're never actually choosing what to do. It's mm. Netflix to a T, isn't it? I could watch that. I could watch that. But it's all just five out of tens. There's no movie okay. that's hitting me right now, you know? It's, it's interesting. And, and, and the question around that is, is... When, when back in the day when the Simpsons were on once a week, you know, right. seven, at seven o'clock or seven thirty, it's like, did you appreciate and did you value and did you rate that episode at a much higher rate because it wasn't available and you didn't have, you know, another episode that you could just have at your fingertips? Mm -hmm. You know, we have so many things available to us. Then does that impact our relationship with our viewing of? Uh, uh, let's use Netflix as an example. You know, yeah this whole paradigm that we've stepped into is like this analysis paralysis because we have so much at our fingertips. We can't actually knuckle down and kind of say, I'm here. I'm present. I am uh, either listening to a piece of music, but truly listening to it for what it is. Uh, I'm uh, simply, like we said before, just sitting in silence mm. going for a walk listening to the um to the wind in the trees listening to the rain coming down because there's a buckle load of it right now in Melbourne. Yeah. 
you know, like we've lost that. It's like a lost art appreciation for, for the simpler things in life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, one of my favorite quotes um, was, was um, it's in the intro to um, my favorite book by Aldous Huxley, which is Brave New World. And um, that whole book for people who don't know was just basically a, a, a giant metaphor for kind of, you know, um, many of the ways which we live now, you know, everyone is happy all the time, um, which speaks to that idea is a slave a slave, if he doesn't know he's a slave, mm. um, they take a pill called Soma, and they're happy all the time. And because they're happy all the time, um, the powers that be are able to enforce just the worst work on 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 people. And there's a there's a there's a, a hierarchical system and the protagonist kind of breaks free from from all of that. But the in the introduction to the book, the um the the writer is talking about you know um the pill the soma pill and 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 he says in a world where nothing has any um value no meaning can be derived yeah. and that's very true you know and to use your point perfectly as someone who grew up literally watching the simpsons i couldn't wait to get home on a friday night because it was so fun and that was mm. often embedded in going to video busters um to to get a, a vhs tape you know and and even the pain of having to rewind it to the start because someone you know didn't didn't afford that to you. Yeah, you're like, oh my god, they didn't rewind it again. <laughs> that's it. That's it. But even that, Netflix has has added that convenience and just play from the start. You know, and and that's good. And convenience is good to a T. You know, it's, it, I mean, you know, taking a slight tangent, capitalism has um, pulled us from the dirt. And capitalism can be tyrannical, of course, but it's lifted a lot. You know, even even places like Africa um, are so much better off than they were 150 mm. years ago. But this constant rush to convenience has taken away the the meaning and the fulfillment that comes from earning a reward. You mm. know, and we actually kind of have to reverse engineer and engage in that pain consciously now, just to find that homeostasis and balance. Hundred percent. And Netflix is like. You said that they've, uh, you know, got, gotten to a point where you don't even need to rewind it. They, they, they take it one step further. They automatically play the next episode if you right. don't actively turn it off. So they've tapped in and understood and known, like, next episode is going to play in three, two, <laughs> one, and then you go down. It's like, you know, they tap into your subconscious as to you like this, people that watch this also like this, you know. Mm. So if you if you don't do the thinking for you this technology is going to do it for you mm. you know and some people th will, will say that's convenient and it is convenient but like sometimes convenience is not the answer right. you know reminds me of a a quote that i read by one of you know a great bass player victor wooten and he talks about the space in between the notes mm. that really is the magic behind the music and uh, I, I, I le recently been taking a very deep dive into my, uh, one of my favorite bands, especially back in the nineties were the red hot chili peppers and oh, nice. Rick Rubin was the, um, producer of mm. what I feel is, uh, you know, an absolute masterpiece, blood sugar, sex magic. Oh, and great album. And he, he delved deep into, uh, you know, uh, conversation with all four members and, uh, you know, he was talking to uh, John Frusciante and uh, and Flea and he was talking uh, to them about basically they were saying, you know, before Blood Sugar Sex Magic, they had this ability to play and there were, the, 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 there were these children. They would fill this incredible um, music up with, with notes and, and passion and uh, desire and can-do attitude, but once they started to refine their style and create this space in between the notes, all of a sudden a masterpiece was unraveled. And it's mm. like, if I can use that as an analogy to, to, to be able to kind of like peel back the layers of life and actually sometimes, you know, remove the details and the stimulus. And once you have that ability to be able to breathe and yes, at times be bored but what comes from that boredom? Like what will come as a result of those spaces in between the notes of your day, you know? Mm, mm. So if you don't have that ability to contemplate, to breathe and to be bored, then nothing else will come of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love it. And you know, one of the way I one of the ways I see um I didn't actually know Rick Rubin produced Blood Sugar Sex Magic. That's awesome. That's, yeah, that's yeah, such he, a that, good album, that one. That was his that was his starting uh the start of his relationship with the chili peppers and he's done like uh yeah, a hell of a lot. Mm. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. I mean you're exactly right. I think, you know, a lot of this is speaking to the polarity, you know, however you want to call it, yin and yang, light, dark, stimulus and processing, sleep and wakefulness. Mm. We, we, we're awake all the time. And, uh, you know, <laughs> to be somewhat esoteric, we can't see anything because mm. we haven't, we're not, we're just too much in the trees. Mm. And um, and even and even I noticed that one of the... Um, people who I love following is Naval Ravikant. Mm. And he talks about how um, meditation for him isn't necessarily some sort of practice. It's just sitting in silence, you mm. know, and, and he kind of uses the metaphor that sitting in silence is akin to slowly starting to work through the inbox of your yeah. life. And mm. if you've never touched your emails, there's going to be a whole bunch of spam a whole bunch of people who are really angry at you. And then in there, you got to sift through all of that, but you might find some gold, people that really loved a, a, a piece of content you made, someone who wants you on their podcast, um, a potential job opportunity. But you have to sift through everything in order to find those nuggets. And, and, and meditation or sitting in silence is is kind of like that. You do have to be bored and and, and get used to being bored at base level so that you can allow nuggets of wisdom to come through. Because mm. the coolest thing about ideas, in my opinion, is that people who change the world go off ideas that have been out there for a long time, but they make it their own. You know, you can, you know, you can even look back at um, the way Fred Astaire danced and yeah. just how much of Michael Jackson is in Fred Astaire. Mm. But Michael Jackson took elements of that and then made it his own. Now mm -hmm. there'd be no Michael Jackson without Fred Astaire, but there'd be no Michael Jackson without Michael Jackson. Spot on. I, I love that. And, um, you know, that, that opens up a question of like, what, what is plagiarism? What is copying? What is, what is plagiarism? What is inspiration? Well, mm. you know, the, there, there is no, nothing without inspiration. You know, there's no, uh, I don't know, there's no Kiss without the Beatles, but mm. there's no Beatles without bloody, you know, um, uh, Robert Johnson, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we can keep on going further or, or, or Elvis and, and you go further and further back until, you, you know, you, you're in Africa uh, doing tribal dancing right. in, together, you know. Yep. So um, I suppose, uh, you, you know, if you, if you use inspiration, uh, you know, that will get you to uh, wherever you are, but like, it's also just justif justification as well. And we can, we can go further down that. I don't know how we got to physical inspiration, <laughs> <the> case. <laughs> but, but here we are. And, and you, you discussed something earlier, reminding me of uh, a quote, a really, really powerful quote um, that I was told a, a while back now, and that's a, a man born blind doesn't know what it's like to experience darkness. Mm, beautiful. Mm. It's mm. and it's like if you don't have that polarity, if you don't understand what it looks like on the other side of the fence, then you can't appreciate what you have right here and now. Mm, absolutely, it's amazing, isn't it? That that idea of always wanting to have something to do, um, leading to boredom, because then now all of a sudden you've got so many things you can do, and none of them back to my original point, um, you know, seems valuable or important because it's a whole mm. bunch of things, mm. you know, a, vi a video tape, a really scratchy VHS tape, you know, that, that you bought. And, you know, we, we used to rent, um, you get this deal at video easy. I'll never forget. It was like seven, seven weekly movies. Um, I think you get like a one new release movie or something before DVDs. It was like under 10 bucks or something. We'd often I get a piece all the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was so good. Love it was so it. good. But even there, you see the value hierarchy, and we we would more often than not watch the new release first. Mm. But but in but even in that even in that business model was like, you've only got this new release perhaps overnight or for three days. 
Yeah. So scarcity does create a value hierarchy. And now without any scarcity, it's like, well, who am I? What do I do? So what we want to do back to boredom and the power behind it is remove all the things that we could do to find what it is that we can do. And if you want to really bring this down into your life, your mission, your purpose, who you want to be, why boredom is necessary. David Data, who is very important in my life as a spiritual teacher, I love his books. He said, um, if you want to find your purpose, shove yourself in a room for three days without any windows and stimuli and, and see what comes to you and tell me what it is that after those three days, you just have to do and cannot wait to get out of that room to, to do or begin, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And people are like, oh, that's such a wonderful idea. It's like, yeah, but you got to be bored for three days. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. want to do that? <laughs> And that's what I hear over and over again about the Vipassana experience. You know, mm. you go through this enormous textual converse, conversation in your own mind. Um, you go through the anxiety, uh, physical anxiety, uh, mental anxiety, spiritual anxiety, but more often uh, for a lot of people, there's that breakthrough moment. But in order to get to, to that breakthrough moment, you need to go through all this chaos and, and shit before mm. it because it's not, it's 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 not just a you don't just go straight to the the happy ending you sure, know sure it, 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 you need to go through this uh th this challenge this difficulty to break through something mm. did mate you as someone who has done a vipassana retreat did what could you talk about your own experiences with that i think that'd be really um valuable so I, i've never actually done a vipassana uh oh, retreat right. I did a, a 10 day silent meditation, a, a few of them actually, um, uh, meditation retreats. Mm -hmm. Difference between Vipassana and these retreats were that there was some form of external stimulus. We would learn about, um, we would learn about Buddhist teachings and then we would meditate on those teachings. So mm, nice. There was something tangible for us to gnaw on in our yep. in our mind, uh, yep. and w whereas from what I understand, vipassana is really just about centering your breath and just you're there, you're naked, and you are like just breathing. Yeah, yeah. Days yep. for seven days. So, um, mm. yeah, my, my experience was 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 incredible. I loved it um, for that particular point in my time, which was exactly your age yeah <laughs> right now tommy um yeah. was when i found myself in india um probably going on a a life changing trajectory uh and and it, and it was it was magical it was incredible mm. and it was uh it was just simple but 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 life altering well i mean this is our point though simplicity uh affords you the opportunity to go deep not wide and you can mm. get to the when you remove all the obstacles you can go really 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 far on that one thing this is kind of like the point that i make with because i do couples counseling um along with working with individuals and uh, i wrote a blog about this but something that really comes up a lot in this day and age as you can imagine is um polyamory mm. you know or, or being single again um mm. Usually this conversation happens with an individual um, mm -hmm. who is in a struggling relationship. And I might just give that um, that um, that point there that usually the greener grass becomes greener when we're in a point of pain. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I really spent a long time like trying to think about this, you know, um, with the rise of social media, it's easier to see greener grass, you know, no matter what domain we're speaking in here. Um, but people are like, well, you know, People do it now, you know, thruples is a thing, um, having one partner and then having a couple on the side and so forth. And people often make the anthropological point, you know, often, you know, this is kind of what we were like from a spiritual point. And I'm not trying to say what anyone should or shouldn't do, but I'm just trying to give people all of the points of awareness. If you have a conscious relationship, something that you and I learned in our previous podcast with Elisa, it was an mm. amazing show. Amazing. Um, Probably be two shows and we'll have it back. We'll have it back. Yeah, consistently for sure. And and Rich as well. Um, yeah. Sure. But going deep with someone um, consciously is a, is a way to grow. You know, mm. now you could go, you could grow going wide as well, but the depth and the meaning derived from one person 
that's the positive side from it, you know? Mm. So you can get those breakthroughs and those points of awareness, but you do have to sacrifice alternative options and opportunities. And I think some, something that Simon Sinek talks about is that there's always going to be an opportunity cost in life. You can't always have all of just the good stuff. Yeah. So yeah. choosing your opportunity costs is, is the main thing here. Absolutely. And that's like the, um, that's, that's the reward. It's yeah. like knowing that you are foregoing something that could be short-term pleasure, for example, to play the long game, to be able to nourish, let's, let's use uh, what you were talking about earlier, to be able to nourish um, uh, a relationship that you're choosing to devote your, your life physically and spiritually uh, towards that that nourishes your choice even more. This mm-hmm. this opportunity cost that you make, it's like because you're for, foregoing having three different partners to be able to invest yourself consciously in this. And I'm and and once again, you know, this is just me, you know, speaking from my own experience. Um, that 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 adds to the value of the decision that you're making. That the the, the short term pain or discomfort. Yeah. Yeah, t- totally. And, and, you know, t- to your point before about, you know, you, you and I having uh, decided to walk down a path of monogamy, I think what, what comes back to it again is whatever you're trying to gain from life, you know, and you and I, we, we, we see life as a, as a curriculum of the self mm-hmm. giant classroom, you can do it kind of any way you want. If, if you wanted to, um, you know, just play the field and be single and, and do that, you could use each sexual interaction or, or romantic interaction as a, as a vessel for growth. What did this mm-hmm. teach me about this? Why was I closing my eyes when we're having sex? Whatever it is, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but back to the point, I think, it, I think um, it, we can apply the point of being bored, but seeing the, the value in allowing ourselves to be bored to then come to greater self-awareness is mm. in switching off all of those things to go deep into the self to then find truths. And even from a less esoteric perspective, um, when the mind is too distracted, we get anxious. You know, mm-hmm. so we'll just cut all the spiritual bullshit for a second as much as I, lo- as much as I love it. Anxiety is a major player in, in today's world because there's just too much for the brain to take mm-hmm. in. And the brain mm-hmm. is always saying, is this safe? Is this not safe? Mm-hmm. That's it. it what it is designed to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, most of the stuff that we're talking about here is safe. Yes. But the brain needs time to process all of that, you know? Absolutely. And uh, I think uh, in, in today's world that we, that we live in, uh, especially, you know, we were talking about relationships. If you're mm-hmm. finding that you are bored in your relationship, you know, use that as a as an opportunity to kind of look within and also to be able to be open, honest, and vulnerable mm-hmm. with your partner and say, you know, how can we explore this relationship to either A, appreciate the stillness and and B kind of then use that as a point to um you know, to maybe move and grow together and, and explore the relationship even further. Mm, yeah, I, I, I could not agree with you more, man. I think what a really powerful point of awareness is exactly what you just said. When you're feeling bored, have a think about your own unmet needs, you know, because if you are feeling bored, well, then the problem lies within by definition. Mm. And that's and that's great. It's, it's difficult to come to realise. Um but it's also liberating because because if it's your problem then you can change it mm. you know and that's pow- that's that's powerful and you, you can regain that agency you mm. know it's like if i'm bored in a relationship well it's like well my partner needs to change it's like well that 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 may or may not be true but now the power lies with her and you can't do anything and you're the victim of that circumstance yeah you're powerless i i 100 percent agree with you and uh, I mean, I'd go as far to say that any circumstance you find yourself in in life, um, the only empowering way, and some people, you know, some people in this world have been dealt a very, very challenging hand, right? Where I look at you and I look at me, we are white, 
privileged, totally. uh, you know, men that are growing up in a world that definitely favors all of the hands that we have naturally been dealt. Mm -hmm. But the only way that I can rationalize moving forward in life is to be able to look at the way you discussed it by saying, what can I do to be able to change the situation that I have been put in or I have chosen to put myself in? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I've, I've touched on that point um, a lot in podcasts and speaking with colleagues and, and so forth. And the whole thing about, um, you know, social change versus personal responsibility. Um, it, 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 once again, the answer lies within the gray, you know, um, the point that really helped me, um, feel like I could speak on that, um, was reading Viktor Frankl. Mm. who found himself in arguably the worst situation imaginable where he had every right to blame everyone else for his mm-hmm. suffering because everyone else was putting a tremendous amount of pain onto himself, his family, the entire Jewish community as obviously you're, um, you're a part of mate. But the thing is he, what he found was that um, given that he was in that circumstance as troubling as it was for him, you know, seeing himself as a free agent to the best of his ability was one of the major contributors to him. Um, and you know, you don't want to be like, Oh, well, if he hadn't have done that, then he might've gone out. Cause you know, there's, a, in, there's so much luck with, with what the atrocities of the Holocaust, but at least that thing of it's so important for me to finish this manuscript, which I think became the doctor in the soul, nine, 1945. Mm-hmm. And I think he had the manuscript taken off him in the beginning. Um, when the, um, what do they call him? The Dark Angel. What was his name? Um, who was who tested on all of the twins? Um, uh, uh, it was the Mendelev Doctor of Death. or uh, Mengali. Yeah, yeah was it, it was Doc- Mengali. Angel or Doctor of Death? Angel of Death. Doctor of Death. Yeah. Mm. So he, you know, I'm fascinated by the um, the Holocaust, and he he stood there at the train, and he would go like this for people off to the off to the um, the uh, the gas, chamber. the gas chambers and then others for, for work and so forth. I think he, he, uh, Victor Frankl's manuscript was in his jacket or something. Anyway, he was so determined to finish that manus- manuscript that it led to this idea of logotherapy, a purpose mm-hmm. pulling you forward. Who knows, you know, um, maybe there was many other people. In fact, I'm sure there were who, who passed that had this idea of purpose as well. So we're not going to say luck wasn't, um, involved in it, but mm-hmm. even when you're in that circumstance, you know, it would be, I can imagine it would be better for your, just for your sense of self to go, what, what can I do? Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe what, what you can do as well is, is lead the charge in social activism. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, you want to feel empowered in this life and it doesn't have to be, well, because you're, you come from privilege, therefore you don't know what it's like and you can't talk about it. Um, Because even though that, that is true to a degree, um, it, it doesn't lead to, to any sense of fulfillment. Absolutely. And, and it also doesn't lead to having just an open conversation right, with, yeah. with as many people. And I feel like that's almost like a dying art form. Uh, a lot of people aren't able to have just open conversations with one another mm. and, and and say things and perhaps be corrected and say, right, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. That's that's an amazing way to, to think of the way the world works, you know? Mm, mm. And, I mean, Part, part of the thing that you and I are opening ourselves up to for this show and having been podcasters for years is uh, social critique, which I, I am super open to. If anyone vehemently disagrees with anything I've just said, then please, um, you know, comment on the show, let us know, um, do, it a, do it in a kind way because yeah. being, being a human being, if you just attack me, I'm, I'm, my walls will go up. So I'm, not, I'm probably going to be less inclined to be able to engage in that. Um, but I want to learn. I agree. And, uh, yeah, respectful engagement is always the way to, to go about it. And I think you and I, you know, use that as a foundation for our communication piece. And we're always open to uh, dialogue and conversation and uh, criticism if it's done respectfully. And uh, so if anyone does have any feedback, for sure. bring it on. Hey, the entire all- show. But here, I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> no worries, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to tie all of this back into you know boredom and uh silence you know using that as a platform to be able to contemplate 
and to mm. be able to think and to be able to create um you know thought eggs that you can kind of uh flesh out and grow I, I I think silence is going to be a great opportunity in today's day and age for everybody and me, me definitely included because I feel mm. like I uh have have really struggled with being silent at times and to be able to you you know instead of going to that podcast that I want to listen to because you know it's entertaining but it's also populating that the, those spaces in between the notes you yeah. know let's become a little bit more refined in our thought processes and have a little bit more uh space because we can really really um you know kind of use that as an opportunity to grow love it brilliant paulie as always mate talk to you soon thanks guys thanks guys